I ha have a series of slides which will all be available to you because there's a lot of information on them. But I really want to have time at the end of this for questions. So I'm going to go through the slides fairly quickly. Um, again, if you, uh, I'm also going to give you my email address, which is kborgenicht at gmail.com for any kind of questions or concerns, because this is a very, very unusual time. Um, as as we're all aware, in Montana, we're actually oh, fairly um, lucky <laughs> as compared to some places like New York. I was just looking at the numbers, and New York is pretty amazing. Um, this is a talk that actually I was planning to give because it's it, it's um, this week is the advanced is advanced decision making week, and I think it's particularly pertinent to our time right now. I'm going to go through some stuff that I routinely do in terms of talking about advanced care planning and run through some quick tools, but then I want to talk at the end about some specific things about around COVID and how to work with that. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So again, I'm going to define advanced care planning because I think there's some there's some confusion about it. I'm going to discuss its impact on, on care. I'm going to talk about advanced planning, when it should happen, and talk about it really being a conversation. And then I'll talk about COVID and its impact and resources, of which there are now many. Um, so I want to talk about a, a, a patient of mine uh, real quickly who showed up into the emergency room. She was 84 years old. She had a history of all of the above. She had a very significant, she had a pulse which said comfort care. She had been in hospice on, in the past. The assisted living um, facility where she was thought she was having a stroke and so sent her to the hospital. So what happened was a TPA protocol began. Everybody knows what that looks like and included blood work, emergency CT scan, cardiac monitoring, neurology was alerted. The primary care doc who happened to be was not alerted except by the daughter. Um, I then spoke to neurology and said, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Nobody had talked about this patient's functional status. The pulse had been right at her bedside, um, but they had still gone ahead with um, going through this whole stroke protocol. Nobody had actually taken a time out to say, wait a minute, what are we doing? So that, that's sort of an example of where the best of all plans um, doesn't always work. Luckily, the daughter who knew me quite well called me and it happened to be in lunch, my lunch hour so I could go down and, and change the course of what they were doing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about history because I think it's really important when we're talking about advanced care planning because so much has changed. I think many of you are aware who um, Nancy Cruzan was. She was a woman who was in a persistent vegetative state and um, was in the state of, of um, uh, wherever she was, I blocked it out right now, um, basically said they could not withdraw the feeding tube. And that was a court a case that actually went to the Supreme Court. So I thought her, her um, gravestone was really important because it says born July 20th, 1957, departed January 15th, 1983, at peace, December 26th, 1990. Seven years to get that to get her feeding tube done. So, just real quickly, because again, the context of advanced camp planning I think is important. Um, in 1996, 1960, when a person was a DNR, they had no choice. The doc basically wrote it up on a chalkboard, and invariably, the people who were more who were made DNR versus other people were people of color and women. That changed after 1983 when Nancy Cruzan case went to the Supreme Court that, ma that, that made a definition of what is an advanced directive and also talked about how an NG tube is actually a medical procedure. It's an artificial nutrition and hydration. Um, in, 1998, in 1990, Missouri was the state. Thank you so much. I knew it was an M state. Um, in 1990, the Patient Self-Determination Act came out, and that was really the thing that brought advanced directives to the forefront. Um, that was also around the time that Pulse started, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, unfortunately, what we found out 
1996, when there was a study done about how we died in America, that even with the Patient Self-Determination Act, we were not getting advanced directives. Patients were dying in ways that they didn't want to. And we repeated that study in 2006, and there were very similar things. So we started to look at what, what does it really mean to have an advanced directive, and is that the gold standard, or is it more a conversation? And then, of course, now we have, have COVID, which has really gone into high gear in terms of what we should be looking at in terms of conversations. So we've learned a lot since 1990. Um, I've highlighted a couple of things. It's about the conversation. It's not about do not resuscitate. It's not about a checkbox. Um, I think, you know, we, we feel comfortable sometimes if we have a checkbox in front of us, but I can tell you that we, um, that when you are actual in clinical situations, having just a checkbox doesn't really help you. Um, it is about a system, and that's one of the problems um, that I think we run into is that we don't have good systems for doing this. And then finally, there are lots of ways to have this conversation, and I'm gonna show you some of the ones that I particularly like, but I think you need to pick one that works for you and your organization. Um, we're still learning. So often when a decision is needed based on these advanced directives, patients are, are often unable to do it. Um, when it works well, when you have a good advanced care planning, and mind you, I'm not saying directive, when I say advanced care planning, when it's done well, people are less likely to die in the hospital and less likely to get all, all care possible. Um, okay. Um, we've still got a lot to learn. I hear again and again about limited training and limited time for providers. Um, I, this is what I do for a living. I I've, I've have these conversations all the time. So um, I think it's, it's interesting that we haven't progressed further to figure it out how providers and systems can have time. Um, conversations remain um, limited to do not resuscitate. I cannot say that enough. Um, you know, we had, I had one friend whose mo mother at 94 was in, was in the hospital, then was in the nursing home, then was in home health, and was asked with each admission whether she wanted to be resuscitated or not. That was the conversation. And finally, the last time she was asked that, she said, darn it, I don't want to have this conversation anymore. I want to be full code, even though in the past she'd been DNR. Um, I think we don't understand the value of having these conversations, and particularly now, it's really key. And I cannot st stress this enough, it's a process. So, um, and, and let, me, let me talk about that being a process um, personally. So for example, I don't wanna be on life support for a long period of time, but I have one child who lives out of town. Okay. If I should die right here, right now, I don't, I'm not planning on it, thank you, but if I do, um, I would want the people around me, there are a couple of people in the room, to try to do CPR because I want to try to find a way to say goodbye to my child, okay? Um, so I think that changes things a little bit, the context of who you are. It also, the context of what experience you've had in the past with death and dying is really key. So again, in my own particular case, both of my parents died when I was not around. My mother died suddenly and was basically found. Um, she did not have an opportunity. I did not have an opportunity to say goodbye to her. And so that, that, um, that kind of emotion I know comes with me when I'm having these conversations. Just as a, as a side note, when I think about all the people who are dying now who don't have their families with them and the heroic things that people are doing to try to have communication with them is really remarkable. Uh, one of my favorite cartoons. I'm going to see. I'm going to send you to someone who's not afraid of doing a little harm. This is why I get the New Yorker magazine for their cartoons. Okay, so who should have an advanced care planning document and conversation? Really, anyone over the age of 18. 
Uh, people, when they go into the military, they are required to fill out advanced directives. Certainly anyone over the age of 65. For seriously ill patients, it's a little different. They should have advanced care planning discussion, a document, and then we'll talk about the post. Um, I just wanted to bring a couple of, of cases that I had before. This was pre-COVID, because right? I think this has changed some. These were two, two people that I took care of. One was a 94-year-old woman who was hospitalized twice in one month. She was living alone and she wanted to go home. The son was convinced that she had many good years. And I had multiple conversations with him about this. Um, she finally did, like after the second hospitalization, get on hospice and died within a month. Um, then there was a 96 year old woman who was told by a physician that she might have less than a year to live because of possible cancer. At 96, they were not going to go through a big diagnostic workup. The daughter wanted to sue the physician because she had told her mother, her 96 year old mother, that she might have cancer. Uh, Joanne Lynn, who's a palliative ger care geriatrician, I've known her for years, um, has this perspective on that. We live in a world of the temporarily immortal. Um, I want to stop and talk about COVID for a moment because one of the things that is coming up and we're having multiple discussions online about it is that patients may have a good directive. They may have had a good conversation, but because COVID is appearing as an acute illness, they're saying, wait a minute, of course this doesn't apply now. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I wanted to bring that up. So, COVID, um, I think we have all seen this. We've all been affected by it. Um, I've talked about people dying without family, people dying without important traditions. Um, our bereavement counselor here at hospice has actually come up with a, a wonderful way of sharing end of life ceremonies online or via Zoom or whatever, whatever people are doing that I think is really important. There are obviously are a tremendous amount of religious traditions that were being, that are being limited, which is really um, difficult in, in the Jewish religion. People are supposed to sit for seven days, it's called Shiva, and um, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't get together that way. Um, I think there's limited access to care. Who is doing grief and bereavement care for these people? And again, conversations are happening over the phone, and I'll, I'll give you some models for that in a little bit. So when it comes to advanced care planning, I think you pick one. There are many, many ones out, many, many ones out there. This is the one that I like the best. And I was talking to a friend of mine in California, and she said, oh, I've got this great advanced care planning document, and this is how they do it. And we shared what it was, and it was the same thing. So this is being used pretty much in a lot of different areas. I know across Montana, people have chosen what they want to use, but this I found has been really successful. It's a great website. You can use, you can print out the brochure, which goes through these steps and, and then, and it's very easy to talk to patients about it. And then out of it, you can make a document. The documents are also online. So the most important thing about any document, it doesn't matter what you're going to do, any conversation, is who's going to be that decision maker? And who is that backup person for you if you can't make decisions? And more and more with the COVID, that's really, really important. Then under the, the prepare for your care, it talks about what matters most in your life, and there are five questions. Um, if what's important, what experiences have you had with serious illness or death? I talked about that a little bit, but I found that if I don't know what experiences people have had, they bring a whole agenda to the table and I don't know what it is. So I have to find out what that is. Um, what brings you quality of life? You know, my husband said to me last night, you know, I really just like sitting around here, hanging out with you, watching TV and talking to you. That brought him quality of life. I'm not sure about me, but that definitely brought him quality of life. And then if you were sick, what would be the most important for you? 
and have you changed your mind? Again, this is, this is a conversation. Um, choose flexibility for your decision maker. That ends up being fairly important because I've had patients say, I want this to be this way. However, my daughter is my decision maker and she's going to have to make those decisions and she's going to have to do what she feels is right for her. Um, tell others about your medical wishes. I think this is also really key and something we haven't done routinely. This is a family discussion. You've got to talk to your family about it. Um, after all this conversation, then you can do the document. So some of the other things that are out there, there's a conversation project, which is a California, um, there's, which gives some specific phrasing for talking to family. There's a Stanford project that talks, starts with a letter. Um, so there's, you can, you can pick whatever you want. Um, uh, University of Wisconsin has, some, University of, of Washington has some specific things. Again, I think the advanced care planning prepare for your care document is really great. The, just a little quick history behind that. Um, Rebecca Sadari, who, who did this, basically looked at advanced care directives and said, these are complicated. These are difficult to follow. The average literacy in this country is eighth grade. I'm gonna make a document that is of the eighth grade level. And that's what her document is. And it works really well. You can get it in different languages. I want to switch gears a little bit because I want to talk about serious illness, which is a different conversation. Okay, advanced care directives and planning is is for to to anticipate conversations are serious about seal, serious illness are different. Okay, they're still sort of the same principles, but you've got a real problem that you're actually facing. So these are the kind of things that we as palliative medicine docs get specifically trained in. The advanced care planning documents from before are basically done with healthy people. You can do them at the wellness visit, you can do it wherever. So what we found is that, how do you decide who's got serious illness and when do you have these conversations? So the surprise question is predictive almost 100%. Would you be surprised if patient died in the next year? It's surprisingly predictive. Um, people who have multiple hospitalizations, we see that a lot on hospice. Um, new life-threatening diagnoses, we know that we have, we should be having these conversations sooner than later, not to bring people on hospice, but to help them with their symptoms and help them cope with whatever illness it is. Um, spikes is out there, that is something that the residents use a lot. Um, it, it's very similar to, um, uh, what I was trained in, which is a serious illness conversation guide, which is setting up the conversation, assessing and understanding of preferences, sharing prognosis, exploring key topics, goals, fields, worries, sources of strength, abilities, trade-offs, families, and then summarize that. And, and you're, you know, as a professional or as a, you can make a recommendation, you can check in with that patient and then affirm that recommendation. So again, there's spikes, which is very similar, and then there's serious illness conversation. Um, so the serious illness, I've, I've put this all into the um, uh, presentation, which you can get from the handout. But I want to emphasize a couple of things. One, language matters. We've got to talk in a language of the people understand and silence matters. That was probably the biggest thing that I learned is how to be silent. It's amazing how much that helps patients really start and families start talk about what's going on. It's, it's not comfortable, but it really works. Um, I wanna talk about the, the COVID resources and I'm gonna show you one thing in the, before I, I talk about Pulse. Um, so CAPSI, which is the Center for the Advancement of Palliative Care, has an extensive toolkit, including symptom management stuff and conversation guidelines. Prepareforyourcare.org, if you, if you go in under COVID prepare for your care, they have specific scripts for telemedicine, telemedicine about patients and their advanced directives. And they have a specific handout that I found really interesting for families about how to prepare 
to for getting ill with COVID. Some of the things that they talk about on there is what are your plan for your medications? What's your plan for your medical wishes? How do you plan for your pets? What's how do you plan for your money and bills? And how do you plan for a hospital visit? It's actually a very good patient info kind of thing that I may actually be sharing with some of the assisted livings in our area. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about pulse versus advanced directives because this is always a topic of of concern. Um, you can get the, this will again be on your handout, but you can get this um, document anywhere. So the pulse is not an advanced directive. The pulse can be part of a conversation, an advanced care planning conversation, but it is not an advanced directive. So I just want to run through this real quickly. The pulse can be provide can be done by the provider or the patient and the patient or the surrogate. An advanced directive has to be done by an individual. So when I get an advanced directive from a demented patient that has signed an advanced directive, I have some concerns about it. Um, an advanced directive is for all competent adults. A pulse is not for everybody. And this is, I think, where we get into the most amount of trouble. The pulse is a voluntary form that is for seriously ill or frail or people who fall under that surprise question. It is a specific medical order. EMS can use it. Advanced directives and advanced directives like the prepare for your care advanced directive, EMS can look at it, but it doesn't tell them, it does not give them an order. Normally the pulse is actually easy to find. Um, and the pa patient or surrogate decision maker and the provider has to sign it. And for the advanced directive, it varies from state to state. Okay, so there's a great article out there that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because you will see all of this in the handout. Um, but but um, uh, Charles Sabatini, who's part of the National Pulse Organization, wrote this article called The Seven Deadly Sins. One is using the pulse with people who are too healthy. So I had somebody say to me, but I don't want to be resuscitated. And they're, you know, 50, they have no serious illness. I said, that's great. Have that conversation with your family, fill out an advanced directive, but it, it, you have to take it within the context of where you are in terms of your health. Um, you've got to have a meaningful discussion. Um, you can't, it, patient, it, it, I had to, some of the assisted livings here were, were giving pulse out to families and patients when they were being admitted and saying, you have to fill that out. Patients need to complete this form with a provider. Or, or patients or their surrogate decision maker. It is a conversation to have with your provider. Um, there were a couple of places that were providing incentives for completing pulse forms. That is absolutely not okay. Um, reviewing pulse forms. We, I have been on a kick to review advanced directives and pulse forms in our EPIC, and I have found so many irregularities in terms of what the pulse is saying, or that the situation has changed and people don't review the pulse. In, in the hospice that I work with, I'm constantly talking about how we are probably going to have to redo the pulse because most of them are not just um, comfort care measures. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about COVID and then I, I want to stop because I, I want to have questions. Um, Palliative care should, and if you get on online and I get all these texts constantly, um, should be a part of every command center. This is a, a, a guideline from the Center for the Advancement of Palliative Care. I can tell you that it's not. Um, no offense to Bozeman, which is doing a lot of surge planning and they're doing a very good job. Palliative care, they, they, it's not there, even though we have a palliative care program in the hospital. Um, I, re I had a conversation recently with um, one of the assisted living directors, and we talked about how scared patients are and residents are, and they don't know quite how to handle all of this. It's a perfect thing for a palliative care physician to or practitioner to get involved in. And I actually talked with her about doing a teleconference with her residents where they could ask me questions. 
and we could talk about what the, what are their fears, what are their anxieties. There's so much information out there, and what might be helpful to them. Um, you know, making a medical plan or looking at your advanced directives and talking about that. You know, what, I was listening to something, a webinar yesterday that they were talking about the survival for people who have serious illness um, and are put on respirators. And with COVID, that is actually 0%. And I think that's something that is really important for people to understand because if you paint a picture of what's going on is it worth it for you to have the rest of your life or a large part of your life to be on a ventilator for two weeks and then after that where are you and do you need would you need to be in a nursing home for a while i think sometimes when you can paint some kind of picture like that you're not trying to say we're not going to take care of you or put you on a respirator you're saying let's talk about what this really looks like um, the other thing from CAPSI, that there's a wonderful little thing about symptom management that is really helpful for taking care of people in homes. Um, again, I've talked about families and people not being able to be with them. So again, these are some of the, the websites that I have already talked about. And then yesterday when I was on, again on this, this um, uh, webinar, they talked about the calmer communication mnemonic. Um, this comes from, um, you can get this off of CAPSI, and it is the COVID ready communication playbook, and there are a lot of different things about it. But I really liked um, the way they structured this because, again, it, it fell into what I've learned in terms of. of serious illness conversations, and also in terms of the prepare for your care. They're all very similar. So the first, the C is for checking in. And how are you doing with all this? What are your concerns about where you are? Ask about, ask specifically about COVID and what concerns there are. Once you've heard all those, then you can lay out the issues, okay? You can say, let's let's talk about these issues. And it may be at that point that you can start to paint a picture about what it would mean if they got seriously ill and ended up in the hospital. What does that look like for them? And what does it look like for them to stay in place? Um, motivate to choose a pra proxy. A backup person is, is actually a language that other people sometimes understand really talk about what matters with that person so that we know as a provider who we can talk to and that you've chosen that person. And then expect emotion. This is really a hard, it's a hard conversation in any setting. In the COVID setting, it's even harder because people are so isolated. Uh, I, I know of a recent um, assisted living in Bozeman where if somebody goes to the ER, they are now required to go on two weeks isolation just for going to the ER, not even being in the hospital. I get it, I understand it, but the implications of it are huge. Um, and then record. And it, you know, I, I've come up with various templates where I record what I've talked about, but that rec record could be anything, just so long as there's some kind of conversation. Who did you have the conversation with? And what were the main points? It doesn't have to be complicated. Finally, okay, so advanced care planning is key in any setting, in any setting. And it's gotta be reviewed, it's gotta be constantly looked at. Discussions by providers are billable. I had this conversation with, I think, Linda last week about this. They are billable, okay? The key, however, unfortunately, is that under the, the CMS regulations, you have to bill for 16 minutes and over. I don't know how they came up with 16 minutes. And then if you have a conversation of 30 minutes or more, you have to put in a second code. So it's a little convoluted, a little nutty. There are no guidelines, by the way, for what the documentation has to look like. You just have to say that you've talked with this person for 16 minutes. Um, how to find the time. I think um, that that is a problem for a lot of practitioners. 
Um, in our setting, sometimes we try to find other people who can do it. Um, and um, then talk with the doc about it. I think the other thing is making it a priority. Um, we have trouble doing that. I, I have, uh, you know, patients can't come out of the hospital and the docs think they have to check all these various things, blood pressure, and weight, and the medications. Yes, you got to check all of that. And you also have to really have a conversation about this because it is a priority. It is going to pe keep people healthier and getting the care they want and out of the set out of this setting. There's a, a um, Sharon Inouye, who's another geriatrician, has a great Jerry Powell um, webinar, which if you don't have get Jerry Powell, you should. Um, and it's all about instead of advanced care planning, she calls it current care planning. And she talks about it in terms of what do you really want to do tomorrow? And we talked about documentation um, because you can get paid, although I just got a little thing from Linda saying that um, they can't get paid in their setting. Um, you may do in other settings, you can do it in regular clinic settings. You might want to do a special visit just for this. We talked about using other resources. Um, is there somebody you can train who's a social worker? Your nurses can do some of the prepare for your care stuff. Serious illness conversation is different and a little bit more complicated. And what are the resources for that in your hospital? In our hospital, we have an inpatient prepare, um, palliative care group that helps us with that. And then finally, we all right now really need to be taking care of ourselves. So this is, this is, um, my favorite quote, which is what matters to the patient is as important as what is the matter with the patient. And I have found that to be the key thing for me. Somebody did actually find out where the, the, the reference came from and I've now lost it. Um, so if anybody wants to send it to me again, they're, help, they're, they're welcome to. It's about the conversation, it's not about the document and it's also a commitment from all those involved. And then um, this is just the view from my house and how I take care of myself. So we have some time and I wanted to have some time so we could talk, answer questions, talk about concerns, et cetera. Um, Amy, do you wanna do that? Do you wanna? Um, if you guys wanna ask a question, you can type it into the chat. Um, there are too many participants to unmute. Um, so, or if you do want to ask the question, you could just on you mute you specifically. Um, I did have one question come in. Um, it was asking, are the documents on the prepareyourcare.org website able to be used in any state? So, so if you get on the, the um, prepare for your care website, first, yes, the answer is yes, but the, the brochure, which is what we give the patients, um, is you can just print that off. There are um, documents for each state, not every state, but Montana has its own specific document. Um, California does, I think uh, Arizona does. I don't know, you have to get on and look at your own state for that. But Montana, if you go to the Montana one, um, it, it's, it works. So I have a question from my own audience right here, yes. So, so the question is, is there a standard for reviewing the pulse without, without just being a change of condition? I think um, over the age of 70, yeah, you should at least look at the documents. Okay? If, a, if you have a five-year-old pulse, that may need to be changed because things could have changed very dramatically. Um, but I don't think you need to do it every six months. And every year, if things are stable, look at it, make sure it's accurate. Other questions? Someone um, shared the link to extension. Yes, Linda did that. So the, the, their extension has a Montana guide um, to advanced care planning and to um, the pulse. 
And that's a useful document. The other great website is the, the National Pulse website. They have lots of information on there. Um, and I would go on there too if you have questions. But also, because I think there is some confusion again, I, I'm, welcome, I'm happy to have emails sent to me and I'm happy to answer them. There is um, a group of lawyers in Montana who have um, created an advanced care planning document um, that's extensive. I think it's about 22 pages. It's, it's very good, but this is my prejudice and, and I will say it out loud, is that I really believe that these are conversations that should be had clinically. And that I appreciate the lawyers having come up with this document because it is good, but um, I think it really needs to be clinical. That is my prejudice. Mary uh, yeah. Helgeson said, I have completed five wishes. Is it a good idea to take it to my physician and discuss it with her? Absolutely. It should be, it, not only should you take it there, you should take a copy and have it scanned into your um, medical file. It's one of the biggest problems that we run into is that people don't um, take their documents to their providers. And and there's been some some controversy about that from the lawyer community that no you don't want to share it because then they're not going to you know give you the treatment no matter what that that is not where it um, should be going the advanced care directives are guidelines and even and I know somebody's going hackles are going to go up on this one even a post can be rescinded. So, and we've seen that, and that means that you need to have more conversation. Okay? If somebody has a pulse that says do not resuscitate, and somebody daughter comes in or whatever and says, no, she never talked to me about that. This is not what we want. Our practice here in the inpatient setting is to have more conversation. We don't just say, hey, sorry, this is what this is the doctor's orders. That says you need more conversation. has been with ACP and these telemedicine as we're rapidly moving to, to that. Mm -hmm. So the question is the use of telemedicine for ACP. So, so again, there are now lots of scripts out there okay, that you can get from the various sites that I've, I've, I've talked about. Um, I have a COVID ready script and I'm trying to remember where I got this one from for patients with uh, advanced cancer, chronically ill or elderly patients. I have one from um, prepare for your care, um, specifically around um, COVID, but I think these can be adapted to any setting. So I, 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 I will tell you that I've been a skeptic of telemedicine. Um, being, a, being on webinars and all this kind of stuff hasn't been my favorite thing, but clearly it's all in the world out there. And I think that we can be using these various guidelines, these COVID scripts, um, absolutely as guidelines for doing advanced care planning in general. And I think actually, if you just go get the prepare for your care brochure, that is such an easy way to have a conversation with pe for people that you can use that as a telemedicine script. Can you address the out of state issue? I have an AD in Washington and end up being cared for in Montana. Is there any way to have my wishes honored? Okay. So, so if an advanced care directive is transferable, it, it, it is different from state to state because the requirements for signatures are different. Okay, so my advice to people is if they have an advanced directive and they bring it to a different state, either do another one or go through it with that person, with whomever, so that they're aware of it. The post is not transferable um, because every state, again, you know, has their own version of it because of different regulations in each state. 
So California has their own regulations. New York used to have some really cuckoo ones out there. I think they, they cleaned that up a bunch because um, I, I know that they've worked a lot on it. Um, but every state is a little different. Montana, being Montana, has very few regulations around this, which is the good news because our form is pretty simple and straightforward. My advice when I get a, a, a pulse from another state is I just, I just do a Montana pulse. That's the differences between comfort measures and limited interventions when reviewing a pulse with someone. Okay, so um, I don't have the, the um, latest um, pulse in front of me. Grab one for me. It's because we've changed the language a little bit. Um, I, I think the difference is that when I explain it to people, this is how I explain it. I say, look, um, if if you want to go to the hospital because you have an acute injury and you want to get it looked at and evaluated and maybe have more conversation about it, um, then I think we check the limited interventions. Okay. However, if really what you want is that, you know, you really don't want to go to the hospital unless you absolutely have to and those are most of the patients on hospice many of the patients who are nursing um in in nursing homes you probably shouldn't be going to the hospital then i checked the the comfort measures so so just for the, on the i just wanted to review that for a second because we've changed the language one is um full treatment that's if you want to do everything the other is selective treatment and that's a goal to treat medical addition conditions while avoiding burdensome measures. And look at the language on the latest polls. And then it's comfort-focused treatment, primary goal is to maximize comfort. Okay, so look at that language again, and I think that, that may help you. Um, and again, you may want to redo them. I think this is a really important conversation right now with the COVID virus because um, we want to keep people out of the emergency room. That is not the best place for people right now. And um, so I'm working with some of the assisted livings around here so that they don't have to send people to the ER. Um, we had a case the other day, patients that I know very well and not, I was not aware of it. The blood pressure went up and the other doctor, this other doctor sent this person, 95 years old, very clear advanced directives to the ER. In the ER, they did a COVID test, and now they have to wait for that COVID test to come back, so the guy's on isolation, and it just it's just sort of a mess. Um, I think it, unless it's really, really um, drastic and you cannot get that person comfortable, um, sending them to the ER right now is not a great thing. You will, you know, uh, Tony Bach yesterday in his uh, thing talked about, um, uh, the issue of resource allocation and and rationing, which is always sort of the you know the R word, and I think it's better to talk about resource allocation and and what it, what does it really look like? What would it look like for you to go to the emergency room at this point and be admitted to the hospital and really paint that picture? I said that earlier, but I think it's important to for us to really paint that picture of what that might look like. By the way, um, if you get onto the website that I talked about with the, the COVID communication skills, um, Tony Bach actually has a bunch of videos on there that you can look at also about conversations. Questions about finding the resources from this presentation. I will be sending out a link to everyone who has a recording of the presentation and also links to the websites and the presentation slides as well. And again, CAPC, Center for CAPC, if you type it in, they have a whole section on COVID and a whole section on, uh, you know, communication tools, including Tony, including Tony Box stuff. So, and again, you have my email. Sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the importance of uh, personally as a healthcare provider having your own ACD to the conversation with your patient as um, being a champion 
of it. So, so yeah, I, I think it's really important. It took me a while to do mine. I actually had my husband and I did uh, the five wishes a while ago and we never got it signed. I really didn't like doing it. I didn't like that form. But then I did the prepare for your care one and we now have that in our, our files at, at the hospital. I think it's really important. Part, and, and partly for you, partly because you had that conversation with your family. You know, I, I've been doing hospice and palliative medicine for a long time. So my, families are, my family is sick of hearing about it. But it's a real opportunity to, to talk with your family. And, and again, I keep going back to prepare for your care because I think those are, people are like, oh, what do I say? And the language in the prepare for your care actually is really good for how to have that conversation with families. So yes, as providers, I think we should be having that. There was a question about hospitals. Five, oh, go ahead. About like between five wishes, respecting choices, um, which form should be filled out? And it's sounding like prepare to your, for your care might be. For me, it's prepare for your care. Um, so respecting choices, just so you understand, is the training program that is out there. And five wishes was the document for it, if I'm correct. Same as prepare for your care brochure is the training or the conversation about prepare about the the document, the actual advanced care planning. I just I just like the language in the in, in prepare for your care. Again, the conversation project has its own one out there. I think they're all pick, pick one that you like. Um, I think Kalispell uses a different one. Um, you know, the, just pick one that you like and see what works for you and try it. Do it yourself. That was the, the other thing. When I tried to do the five wishes, I was like, ah, God, I really don't like this. Um, but when I did the prepare for your care, it was simple. Um, Amy, brought, you said something about hospice being um, a great resource now. Is that right, Amy? And it says, I see hospice is a great resource in caring for COVID patients or patients that have those symptoms that are not confirmed. However, our agency is lacking PPE. What would you suggest? I totally understand that. Um, I think it's a real bind. Um, you know, this assisted living that, that I was talking with yesterday, um, they don't have PPEs. And if somebody turned positive for COVID in their environment, you know, they're not going to be able to take care of them. They're going to have to send them to the hospital, um, which is really a shame because we don't have the equipment and the, and the, the a lot of hospices don't, home care agencies that we're using a lot for providing care don't have them. There's one agency that will be nameless where they, we actually had to get masks for them. Somebody in the community ended up getting masks for these caregivers. So it, 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 it's a real problem. Um, without an, a quick and easy solution. You know, the other, the other problem with hospices is that a lot of the assisted livings are not allowing people in. Same with the nursing homes. So we're sort of doing hospice by telephone, which is, you know, not the best way to do it. Some patients I know, um, some families have actually just taken their family member home. So that we can get in there easier. To review or revise their post with a provider, can this be done via the telephone or a web video chat? Yes, yes. The, actually, if you get on the post website, I, I didn't put that up there, but they are talking about doing that. Yes, by doing it by phone and then having you know discussed with and the date and all that stuff. There's a lot of training and work to be done out there. Hey, uh, thank you for Lin to Linda Rohr and um, the MT uh, Geriatric Education Center in Riverstone Health for hosting Dr. B today. Absolutely. Um, a really thoughtful discussion. And um, just thank you so much for your time. We'll be sharing all the resources in a link after the presentation. I'm going to try to get to it um, tomorrow. If not, by the end of the week, you'll get a recording to this presentation and then also all the resources that were discussed. And thank you, Amy, for, for guiding me through this. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, guys.
Sí. 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 Sí.